Okay, so I might just introduce, I suppose, Grow Remote and Shane. Uh, so Grow Remote is a social enterprise um, and we are on a mission to enable us to work, live and participate locally. So we want our communities to grow and to do that, we need employment in there. And um, through COVID, we're, we're getting a lot of queries around remote work. And we're lucky enough that, that in Ireland in particular, we have companies who have been doing this for years. Um, and Shane Evans uh, built, built the organization from zero to 12 million in turnover, but also did that with a fully distributed team. So all of his team are fully remote. And as I mentioned, kind of, we know the likes of Ian Duffy or Eric or Marie, because they give to the community so often and share their knowledge. And I think uh, that sharing of that best practice is really important because when remote is done well by companies, our communities get jobs. And um, Grow Remote has uh, lots of supports on the website, in our Slack group, in our Facebook group. And if you need anything else or have particular queries, just ask us about for them um, and, and we'll find a way to solve for that. Shane, thank you very much for your time. We're a volunteer organization, but we never take it for granted. So thank you uh, for, while you're here, thank you for all of your team's time ahead of you and then for your own now. Uh, we really do appreciate it. And I'll let you take it from here. Great, thanks Tracy, um, and thanks, thanks for having me here. Um, so look, I've got the chat up and the questions, so please just ask questions if you, if you, um, if you, come, if you have any while I'm presenting. So first, I suppose, a little bit about me. Um, I'm the CEO of Scraping Hub. What Scraping Hub does is we provide customers with web data to innovate and grow their business. It's a really diverse set of applications from competitive market intelligence through to news monitoring, we provide a lot of data for uh, tech companies, use it for AI, machine learning, um, and the customers range from the largest tech companies through to local startups. Um, now, I decided initially to re work remotely, God, it would be about 20, I think 17 years ago, I was trying to work it out for this, um, but I was in a company with three of my friends, and I knew them very well. So it really wasn't, it, it really didn't seem like much of a big deal. And um, we, our, our, our customers, started out being you know local we were living in london but after maybe six months most of them were in different countries um so we just yeah we, we just decided we could work from anywhere um some of my friends went to the canary islands i went out to japan um i later built a remote team for another startup a couple of years later and then finally i co-founded scraping hub in 2010 as a remote first company um maybe remote first is a term you'll sometimes hear um, also called a distributed company, but the idea being that there's no real central office. People can essentially work from almost anywhere. Um, now we're 180 people from all over the world. And as I said, we've no central office. There is about 50 of us in Ireland. And sometimes we work from Cork and Spaces in Dublin and Cork. Um, so it's not that everybody necessarily works from home, but it's no different maybe. There isn't really any head office. And I do work from home an awful lot. Like this is my, This is a bedroom in my house. Um, yeah, and look, when I look back to, to 2010, I realized that I wasn't that concerned about starting out remote first. Um, you know, my co-founder, Pablo, he was in a different country anyway. We worked together, both of us remotely, for quite some time at that stage. Um, and a lot of our early hires, they were also, um, we'd, we'd worked with them before, either professionally, but also uh, through our open source projects. So we'd been used to collaborating with them. We knew many of them had done voluntarily <laughs> what we were hiring them to do. So we knew they loved what they were doing. They were super motivated. There was never a question entered our head. You know, if we hire them, will they work? They were, they were doing it for free often. Um, so that was the really early days. Now it got different, different. It, it got a bit more difficult, I'd say, scaling up a company. Uh, you hire into multiple different roles and things change. And, you know, I, I, hopefully I'll share some of the lessons with you today. Um, when I look back to then, I suppose there was that, that culture around open source that helped. And when I think back to that time, a lot of the companies that did remote work earlier on, they weren't so different. You know, if I look to maybe examples of larger remote working companies, um, like let's say Automatic or GitLab, I'll talk about them in a while, but they're now over a thousand people each, but they both had their roots in, you know, early hiring of engineers, their roots in open source. Um, obviously engineers were early adopters of technology, so that, that certainly helped. Um, but they were also used to collaborating online. Often you'd, you'd work alongside people you, you'd never met. Um, you know, also we, we had what, what in hindsight were fairly good habits around, you know, everything's written down, everything's reviewed, you know, usually everything's discussed out in the open. Um, so some of that, just, there was that culture there at the start of Scraping Hub and some of these other companies um, that, that actually set us up pretty well for what, what came later. Um, now, 
I think for some time there's been a demand among workers for remote working, but management has been has been reluctant. Um, so yeah, and this is a quote from Matt Monomeg. I, I talked about automatic before, but I think he echoes the sentiments of a lot of people within the remote working community that you know this this event that we're all being forced to work at home, well, it might actually change the approach to how more companies work. Um, and you know, I, I recall Buffer put out a, a state of remote work report every year. And last year, you know, they surveyed 2,500 remote workers and 99% of them said they would like to remote work, work remotely for at least uh, some of the time for the rest of their careers. Um, so, you know, that's quite a powerful statement. Most people who are working remotely want to continue it. Um, and the Buffer report concluded that while remote work is sometimes portrayed as a trend, it, what they see says that it's likely to hear likely working from home is here to stay. And that was last year. So now we've got some, thanks to Gartner, we've got some uh, recent surveys that show, you know, 41%, now 41% of employees, they're likely to work remotely at least some of the time post coronavirus. So that's up from, what it, from um, 30% previously. I, I suspect the longer this goes on, the more people adapt to remote working, this, this might even go up a bit more. Um, it also looks like uh, companies are thinking about this, right? Nearly three quarters of CFOs said they're likely to shift at least some of their employees to working remotely. So it does look like it's here to stay. Guys, shout if you've got any questions um, or leave something in the chat if you can't hear. Um, so by now, I think many of you um, that can rem work remotely have maybe some initial experience of it. And uh, so like maybe prior to working remotely, some people would have thought, you know, would have, th would have looked at some of these myths and thought that that's what it was like. And now you're discovering maybe some of the, some of the real issues. Um, I, I always thought these, these myths, I, I used to hear these all the time. Generally, people are getting more educated now about what it's really like anyway. But certainly, you know, <laughs> things like you don't need to attend meetings. I think many people now are finding actually the opposite. Their life seems to be dominated by meetings. Um, working in your pajamas. I don't know why this always comes up. Even when the coronavirus started and people were working from home, there was just this uh, work in my bedroom. Um, <laughs> um, it just, it doesn't happen. I don't know, will Tracy say maybe pajamas on the bottom? I don't, it, no, that's not actually Tracy. All the panelists are called Tracy. So like, you can <laughs> say whatever you like and you think it's from Tracy. Um, so no, it, look, people don't tend to work from their pajamas. Um, and actually creating that separation between work life and home life is, is very important. People tend to rely more on routine um, when, you, when they work remotely. It, and it, actually that separation really helps. There was a survey by Owl Labs recent, recently that asked the question, you know, do you shower or bathe every morning before work? And there was no really difference between remote workers and office workers. Um, working from the beach is the most ridiculous thing that I've, but yet every time you see stock images of remote working, or at least you used to, uh, it was often people working from the beach. I don't get it. It's like, you can't even see your laptop in the sun. It's you can get sand in it. What about power and Wi-Fi? I've never seen anybody do it. Um, the, the one thing that, um, that you see, all right, that people worry about it, managers in particular is that people will work less or slack off. But that things couldn't, it couldn't be further from the truth. Um, actually, there's a lot of studies that show remote workers tend to work more hours. Um, and that, that's almost across the board. Uh, but also that they're often, you know, Work productive and, and hard working um, and they don't like other people yeah there's that perception maybe that they're introverts so that's why they don't go to an office but it's not true at all um, and, and they're every bit of social and one thing that might be surprising is that I believe that working remotely actually requires more empathy than, than working in an office because you know you've got fewer cues to understand other people's emotional state you often have to go by messages or video calls and um, it can actually be you know even require more empathy um, so real issues for working remotely, um, no, let's, let's go to the chat, actually there's a few things. Yeah, I've been working remotely for six years via Upwork and, okay, pajamas on the bottom, bold business on top. Mm. Uh, freelancing is probably different here, the focus is on employment. I'm not sure it matters an enormous amount for some of the remote working mates, I mean, uh, if you're working remotely, you're working remotely. Um, I guess it's different though in terms of what a company can do though to support you, right? Optimate freelancers, if you're kicking and you've got multiple customers, that tends to not be the case. Um, remote worker become less social. 
how do I take that? Well, I, I said I don't, I don't think that's true. Um, but the, the thing is often working remotely, like from a social point of view, I'd rely on stuff outside of work. So I'd, I'd maybe see my friends, you know, as soon as I started remote working, the first thing I did was, okay, right, I'm finished work now, let's go out. You know, unlike when I got home from an office and I'd be tired of maybe watch TV or something, you know, I took up more sports, I went out with friends more. Um, yeah, so that, you may be cut off from that now, but I don't find that people remote working are less social in any way. Um, you probably do want to get out of the house more if you're in the house all day, that's, that's probably natural. Um, okay, so the real issues that you're probably discovering now, especially those people new to remote work. Uh, first up, I mean, both managers and their employees express concerns over less interaction. Um, managers worry that, that employees won't work as hard or as, as efficiently. Um, although, despite what I already said, research shows the opposite. But many employ employees, on the other hand, they struggle with reduced access to managerial support and communication. Um, lack of access to information. So newly remote workers are surprised by how long it takes sometimes to find stuff out. You know, if you can't just go and tap somebody on the shoulder, it can actually take you quite a while and that can be really frustrating. Uh, the social isolation, that, that's a real thing. Um, you know, loneliness is one of the most common complaints about remote work. Employees missing the informal social interaction of an office setting. Now, some people, of course, remotely can go to a co-working space. People have, you know, there's things your, your work can do, and I'll get into some of that in a while. But it's even worse now. You know, I, I'm certainly feeling way more isolated now than I ever have in the past. And that's not because of my remote work. That's because all my other outlets are taken away from me. Um, and distractions at home. You know, it's hard for people to do a lot about this right now. Many people lack childcare. Childcare, um, they have to share spaces with their partners. You know, even, even those of us that are used to remote working and maybe had a productive setup, sometimes don't have it now because, because of the recent changes. Um, but you, and usually those who are doing remote work for a while, they've addressed this, right? They, they've built a productive working environment. Actually, that's often more productive than most uh, offices, especially the kind of open, open plan offices. Um, so yeah, look, most successful workers will focus on building a good routine early on. Um, you know, managers, you can see, worried about maybe people working less, but that's really not borne out in practice. Um, it's distractions, it's good working routine. Those are the, those are the hard things. Um, okay. Um, so a couple of questions, I'll just pick a few of them. Tracy, you can chime in here. I, I, there's quite a few of them coming up, so I'm, I'm probably not reading all of them. Yeah, so uh, if you want to uh, type in the questions in the Q&A box just then, because we can click done when they're done and we're able to track them. So Shane, if you, if you can see the questions yeah, that'd are be good. in there, um, in the, in the Q&A box there, if you want to take um, some, and if you've posted some in the chat, post them over uh, in the Q&A box and then we can- Yeah, 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 them. yeah. Okay, look, I, some of these I, I might get to later actually in the presentation as well. Um, see, uh, the, there's one I'm micromanaging, but I've, I've got a section on this. So look, I might just skip on for a little bit. Um, there's, Perfect, there's quite I a few so, yeah. if, if you feel If you feel, Tracy, that I've answered them, just, just click answered um, yeah. and, and, and I'll get back to them. Will do. Um, okay. I was here. Yeah, okay. So there are some stages to, to adapting to remote work. And I think some companies are going to go through this. And I, I even see people go through this too, who maybe join, go through similar stages maybe when they join us and, and they haven't worked remotely before. Um, and I'd imagine prior to the coronavirus and people being forced to work at home, many companies were what I call level one, you know, it's the base camp here. Um, the, the, these levels I, I took from Matt Mullenweg, his ones were slightly different, but I, I, I love the idea. Um, so many companies I thought, I think we're probably at level one. I'm sure many did it well, but too often I see remote work described as a perk. You know, you're allowed to work remotely. Um, and that's not really a very remote friendly way to do it. And I think maybe in some of these companies, you know, management haven't done it. So they don't really understand remote working. Um, that's the, you know, remote workers are often left out of conversations. Decisions happen without them being present. That's not only bad for the remote workers, but it's dangerous for the organization you know, if you're making a, a big decision, but you don't get any input from your tech department because they're remote, um, that, that can be a real problem. And of course, it may hurt career progress. If everything happens in the office, your work's less visible, you just have the same opportunities for promotion. So maybe there were some companies that did that in the past, but I'm hoping now, after this experience, um, that there'll be far fewer of them. And I think most companies 
certainly now, you know, they're recreated, they're at least one step up from that, which is recreated the office in a virtual space. Um, and that's a big step, you know, and I, and I think people have the tools now to work remotely, maybe not perfectly, um, but we're no longer the, at the, how do I actually set up to work remotely? And we want to move on to that, on from that, I think, to how do you work remotely more effectively? And that's the next step is to change how you do the same things so that they're better adapted to a remote working environment. These things like how do you manage performance? How do you conduct meetings? Um, you'll find yourself moving from, you know, moving towards collaboratively, collaboratively editing documents. Um, but finally, you change how you work to embrace more the inherent differences in remote working. I'm talking about changes to how you communicate, how you interact, the norms, the culture in your company. Um, you know, this real kind of way of working that seems to be common among companies who actually have a work from anywhere policy. And culture comes into it, you know, you need to create that way of working that's really compatible with remote work. And I hope that when, when this is over, if you do need to go back to, you probably will, many of you will go back to the office, but there'll be more people working remotely and hopefully your company um, and your leaders will be better set up to, to incorporate remote working um, into, into, I guess, the way you work. So with that, I'll move on to some of the key um, key tips. Somebody's asking, do scraping have hire outside of Ireland? Yes, we do. We're about 180 people. Only about 50 of us are in Ireland. Um, I'm returning to work after time to raise family and I want to get work remotely. Cool. I need some remote experience. Get my CV. Are there opportunities for attorneys like internships? There are. Are you aware of any remote companies? Uh, Tracy's probably the person to answer that. I can speak to what we do. We sometimes do internships. We have them in marketing. On the engineering side, we do Google Summer of Code. We hire people who contribute to open source. Um, so, you know, but it's probably different for different companies. Um, yeah, uh, looking to, okay, look, I'll, I'll just keep going here. We can go for ages. Um, what challenges, oh, Alan asked one. What challenges have you faced when seeking to scale an organization that's fully remote. Oh my goodness, <laughs> so many. Have you hit any glass ceilings in terms of logistics, business focus, or even support functions, HR, et cetera? Yeah, absolutely, Alan, loads of them. Um, not all of them were, were specific, I suppose, to remote working, but I felt, yeah, there, there are certain stages where everything in a, in a company needs to change as you scale up in terms of numbers. Um, there's something about people management. Like when we got to 30 people, I found we needed a, a, that layer of management that we didn't have as we scaled past 30, 40 people. I felt getting to, I felt we went through a particularly tough time at around 100 people. Um, and often in SaaS companies, and we're mostly a SaaS company, it's around, around 10 million in annual recurring revenue. Like there's a step there where you're, you're just earning enough money to afford, let's say, a, a, a good leadership team, but they're not in place yet. So it's really hard. You're kind of carrying so much of the burden yourself. That brings with it a bit of a cultural shift often as you hire in more senior people and that you need to run a slightly larger company um, and bring in a bit more experience. That's, that's kind of a turbulent time and you need to change maybe the organizational structure a bit. Um, yeah, none of them are glass ceilings, I suppose, but they're just kind of bigger changes you go through. Yeah, look, all the, uh, going from two people or two and a half people, which we were on day one, to 180, um, you hit, hit all these things. Business, yeah, support functions, yeah, absolutely. Um, I feel like we didn't, in hindsight, bring in a strong finance function early enough. Um, that was a mistake, but we, we addressed it. Uh, yeah, at some point we had to bring in a proper HR function. At some point I built a real sales team rather than people just helping out in their spare time. You know, all of that. Um, who should we talk to if we want to partner about internships? Uh, in Titan Scraping Hub, jobs at scrapinghub.com, I suppose. Um, but otherwise, I think Tracy's far better to advise him that than me. Um, so on to some of, the, some of the tips. And look, communication is one of the key things you need to focus on when you move to remote work initially. Um, this is going to what's helped you scale that mountain we were looking at a minute ago. So how you communicate will need to change. You know, you'll need to find remote friendly ways to do what you have been doing in person. So I'm, I'm, you know, did, were you a manager who used to manage by walking around? I, I certainly was when I started out as a manager. Uh, did, did you rely on catching people's attention to talk to them or to bring something up? Um, did you look for a good opportunity? Because that now needs to change. Uh, you need to shift to being more deliberate and planning your communication. So have this structured regular one-on-ones and team meetings. Development teams often have a daily stand-up and you know, those continue, but you can apply similar things to other teams just to create that daily coming together. Um, you know, ask people what they did, what they're doing, maybe if they're blocked in anything. 
uh, create forms when people, where people can come to you as well. Because maybe in the office, other people were relying on your presence and that's now taken away. So remote teams tend to favor asynchronous written communication. And by that, I mean, you know, we tend to send stuff, text messages, and we don't expect an immediate response. It allows for longer blocks of uninterrupted working time. You can batch your replies. So like, you might go into email only a few times a day, reply to everything rather than constantly dipping in and out of it. And the same thing goes for most uh, inboxes or channels you need to, you need to um, deal with things through. So be it Slack, be it um, ticketing systems or whatever software you happen to, happen to use. Um, meetings, you know, they, when I say favor asynchronous written communication, it doesn't mean that needs to be the only thing you do. Have meetings when they're needed, they will be sometimes, but, and don't be afraid to jump on a call if something requires more conversation. You know, you should never spend uh, ages backwards and forwards on email or Slack or something like that where you can sort it out really quickly in a call. Now, not all meetings need to be an hour. That's, I guess, sometimes 10 minutes, sometimes five is enough. Um, so think about the next time you send a meeting, how long should it be? Do we really need an hour? Try defaulting to 45 minutes, try 25. Um, it's, a, it's a real, I think, beginner mistake, I suppose, to fill your day with one hour meetings. Um, don't, yeah, and don't have a, a, a meeting when an email or a Slack message would work. You know, that meeting could have been an email is, is a really common complaint of remote workers um, and it, it just annoys everybody. Uh, meeting etiquette, they would, that, uh, what's, you know, you would have established maybe some way of working, some way of attending meetings in your own office. I don't know if you allow, if people tend to be on their phones in meetings or if they don't or bring their laptops or different companies have different ways, different ground rules. You, you need to establish those now for your video calls. Um, ours are usually, you know, have your webcams on, webcams on provided bandwidth permitting, you know, if everybody has a reasonable connection. Pay attention, no Slack, no phone, participate in the meeting. If an interruption happens, like dogs or kids or something, you know, say hello, welcome them. Um, I've never happened in a meeting where, where, <laughs> where somebody hasn't immediately jumped in and go, oh, let me see. Um, if you feel the meeting is a waste of time, you probably shouldn't be there. And I, maybe this is more my opinion than everybody's. Um, but definitely, you know, if you're gonna favor meetings that involve participation and collaboration, smaller numbers are usually better. And I think it's a signal that something's not quite right. If, if, if you're feeling you, you shouldn't, it's a waste of your time to be in a meeting. Maybe it's the meeting, maybe it's the attendees. Um, I don't know, but I try and avoid those. Um, and usual good practice to in-person meetings, of course, applies in remote meetings, right? Start on time, have an agenda, capture actions, uh, all, all that kind of thing. And, and one thing we do sometimes um, is get feedback, you know, ask people to rate the meeting or get, give you feedback on it and try and improve it over time. So over communicates. This is something you hear from a lot of remote workers and, and remote working communicate companies. If you're in doubt, uh, you don't want to bother something, you know, you don't want to bother something, you should probably just send somebody, just send it anyway, actually, because it's if you're batching and if it's written, it's quick to read stuff. It's not necessarily an interruption the way it would be if somebody's in an office, right? You tap somebody in the shoulder and you, you interrupt them. But if it's a sending, a sending a message somewhere, I can read it when I'm ready. You know, it's absolutely fine. It's far better to earn and, you know, to get it wrong that way than the other way around and, you know, not communicate enough. Um, favor group messages versus direct messages. So larger channels, you know, so you can communicate to the right group of people. You never really want to be having multiple one-on-one -on -one conversations communicating something. It's just a waste of everybody's time. Stuff gets miscommunicated. It's generally not how it's done in, in, in a remote environment. Um, yeah, and of course, you know, use emojis to celebrate things, to show humor, all, all that stuff. You know, use the full range of the tools available, I suppose. Um, write stuff down. This is a, this will be a recurring theme. <laughs> if you have a question, you can't, it's easily ask people immediately around you in the office. So being able to find information is really empowering, I think for remote workers. Um, and it, it makes your organization more scalable too. You don't need to keep repeating the same things all the time uh, when new people come in. It also allows for, if stuff's written down, you, you can review it. And these reviews and comments on documents really common and it tends to happen, it can happen asynchronously. So if you're spanning a different time zone or maybe somebody has flexible working hours and they're not there at the same time, it works well. Um, so create project briefs, create specs. We even sometimes create decision documents about a larger decision. So we documented the whole thing and people can comment on it and you've got this nice record of maybe why some of the decisions that were made were made. Um, and you know, on the theme of writing things down, capture company policies or norms in a guide. Um, one thing that really stuck with me was the first time I went, I went to a running remote, a big, a 
big uh, remote working conference, and I met Dimitri, uh, the CTO of GitLab. And you know, I said, oh, how did you tackle this? How did you tackle this? I was asked, no, so many questions I had for him, but this, you know, the one thing he drove home was, oh, our company handbook, our company handbook. Um, it was the one thing that I came away from that conference thinking, oh my goodness, I've got to make a company handbook. And I just love the way they've done it as well. You know, they've got this culture that's very common to the open source stuff I was talking about earlier, where, you know, if somebody asks a question, they, people will pitch in and help them. Um, but then they'll take it upon themselves to update the handbook and they might also help the next person. It's this idea of paying it forward. Uh, it's really cool. I, I tried to adapt that. I don't think we do it as well, but um, GitLab are a great, great example. Um, actually, I'll take some of the questions here. Um, what type of tools do we use in Scraping Hub to help with async communication? Uh, Slack, yes. <laughs> Slack is one of them. How do you ensure things aren't missed? Good question. You can't. There's no real way you can ensure that things aren't missed. Um, so usually, I mean, if it's something big that I want to announce to multiple people, I, I use multiple channels. Uh, you'd be surprised how often you need to repeat stuff. And, it, and that's not even just a remote thing. That's just a company CEO thing. Um, you know, at any one time in Slack, yeah, things will fly by. I, I, many companies, and I think, I think you know, the, the GitLab example is they, they, they actually delete Slack history after a while. And, um, you know, just to make sure everything actually ends up in the company handbook or ends up somewhere, somewhere else. You know, Slack should be just used for one-off messaging. It's not a reference point. Um, so if, if something's important, I'll generally say it in, a, in an all-hands meeting, I'll send an email, you know, you'll communicate it through multiple, multiple channels to ensure everybody actually gets it. Um, do you use any monitoring tools to try to measure productivity of remote workers? Uh, thinking tools similar to my analytics in Office 365. If you do, does this have a positive negative effect? I don't know my analytics in Office 365, um, but we do use a lot of monitoring tools. And I, and I think I'll talk about them in a minute. We don't monitor hours or anything like that, uh, but we do use tools to do like workforce analytics, a lot of surveys, et cetera. I'll answer that in a minute. Um, do you believe work from home increases or decreases productivity? Jose Fan's asking. Um, I think it's much, I, like most of the surveys show that when you ask people who work remotely, do you feel more or less productive? Most people will say more productive. Um, so certainly people self-report their productivity as being higher working remotely. I'm not aware of any good surveys that have done it in a more objective way, which is to actually find an effective measure and then you know more controlled experiment between the, between the two groups. There is some research that shows that companies, all remote companies, um, tend to grow a bit slower prior to 10 million in revenue, and there's little difference after that. Um, so that's one data point. I think some of the reasons is you pay down a bit of this organizational debt, maybe. Um, you know, you've got to become more scalable, more organized earlier. Also, maybe there's less likely to take funding, and there's a bunch of other stuff that comes along with it. So it's, it's, I don't know, it's kind of hard to say. Um, so I think objectively, it's, it's, it's not so easy to say for certain, but certainly most people report being more productive. I find that different things are better for different, you know, different things work better um, remotely and other things work better in person. Certainly knowledge work works better remote. Um, I can I find it easier to code. I, when I was programming, I find it easier to write stuff. Um, some collaborative stuff works easier in an office. Um, there's definitely a strong case, we do it in Scraping Hub for, for get togethers every now and then. Um, you know, team building, that, you know, building those bonds, that makes you more productive and it makes a huge difference. Also, teams, some teams need to get together to do more planning um, et cetera, and get on the same page. So there's some reasons to sometimes get together. Most remote companies will do get togethers as well for that purpose. Um, as a sales organization and manager who does not like the idea of a staff working from home or remotely due to productivity concerns and trust, what would you say to him or her? That is a brilliant question. And actually I've struggled with, um, I've struggled with sales a bit more than other, other groups. Um, Largely, like there's just some inherent differences in sales. Now, I'll talk to them in a second, but the manager doesn't like productivity concerns and trust. I, I think sales is very measurable, right? Like you can really see how the output of everybody on a sales team, you'll know how many, usually the activities monitored, but more importantly, you'll see, you know, how many deals they're closing and what revenue they're generating and how, the, how they're building their pipeline. And, you know, it's all super, super measured. Um, so I don't like, from a trust point of view, you can kind of see exactly what's happening. Um, so I don't think that should be an issue, but some salespeople won't adjust to it as well. Um, there's often a, 
salespeople tend to be quite social. Often this, their boss in an office, you know, can help people, um, can, you know, can create a bit more motivation for salespeople. So there's a few things like that. There's a guy called Steli Efti, actually, who's a, a CEO of Close.io. Um, and he's given quite a few talks on sales and doing sales remotely and maybe some things your manager could do to create a better working environment for sales staff. Um, I think his conclusions, and, and I'll probably defer to him, he's probably right, is that sales can totally work effectively remotely, but it's, it can be a bit harder, uh, especially on more junior people. So while senior sales staff can thrive in a remote environment, more junior people who will benefit more from being around other more experienced sales reps um, they, they can find it harder. So yeah, there's a bit of a balance. I mean, where I'd like to go with us in sales is to have maybe some element of local working for training and for other things, and as well as a, a remote. Um, so look, there's too many questions here. I'll just <laughs> keep going and I'll get back to them. Um, so set expectations. Be explicit about your expectations. This is, this is a fairly big one. Um, so consider communication. Uh, so, you know, what discussions happen where? Do you, should, you, should somebody discuss something on email, on Slack, on Zoom? Um, what requires an immediate reply versus what can wait? How responsive people are expected to be you know, to different forms of, forms of communication or different communication channels? Because there's always going to be a trade-off between being responsive and being interrupted uh, too often to get work done. And I mean, in the office, sometimes you can't make that trade-off, right? Somebody just come along and tap you on the shoulder and interrupt you. But in, the, in a remote work environment, the workers in control here, they can decide how often they want to check uh, Slack. And you know, I recommend most people disable notifications to not get interrupted the whole time. So yeah, that probably is better having that explicitly agreed, um, at least discussed. Uh, same with working hours, availability out of hours. Um, and there's a big difference between, across organization, but there's also differences within one organization. My expectations maybe of, a, of somebody in a support role is quite different to, let's say, something like software development, because in support, we rely on people to be there at a certain time to answer customer questions. Versus software development, there might be some expectations that they can attend some key meetings, but outside of that, both them and us, you know, we're happier if they work when they're most productive. Um, I know from experience, you can spend hours on a problem some days and make very little headway if you're just not, you know, it's not going great. You could go away, take a break, come back and solve it in you know, a couple of minutes. Um, so you really want to try and work, try and be a bit more flexible and work during the more productive times, especially now when people are trying to balance other commitments, uh, even more so with family or other things they've got to do. Um, and be explicit on goals, milestones, deadlines. You know, those things should always be clear anyway, but you know, it should definitely be tracked somewhere. It should be written down. So, and, and you know, good practice among remote companies. Be flexible. Only ask for what you need. You know, don't ask for a bunch of stuff that isn't really important, um, like you know, strict working hours, for example, for every role. Um, as a manager, of course, when somebody isn't meeting your expectations, it's kind of best to, I think, talk about it quickly, don't let it lie. Uh, if you're going to give direct feedback to somebody, I think it's better to do it on a video call, unless it's something small and you maybe know them well. You might have had ways to, and, and you might have had ways to do this in an office that you now need to do remotely. So even if you maybe didn't, always say things explicitly, people might have read your, read your expressions a bit better. They might have found it easier to understand whether you were dissatisfied by something. And I've got to figure out a way to do that um, to get the message across in a constructive way in a remote environment. Um, so that's maybe something to think about. It, it might be a bit, a bit of a transition. Um, and once again, you know, write stuff down. Uh, it, it'll always help. Uh, How do you promote water cooler, movement, water cooler moments? Uh, so people miss these the kind of office interactions, the more informal side of, of working alongside your colleagues, um, and particularly at a time like this, where and there, there is no exact remote equivalent, but there are things you can do. We do stuff like Donut Pal, so we've randomly paired with other people in the company, and you get to talk to them. Um, Shop talks—they're a bit like our, a bit like TED talks, only less polished, but we do them every couple of weeks. Uh, they're great. They're great. We've had some brilliant ones. It can be work-related. It can be about anything. Um, I love some of the ones about different people's countries and culture. Um, you know, they're, they're brilliant. Uh, we do a coffee with the chief, our water cooler chats as well. Coffee with the chief is just a coffee chat I have. It's, it's an open invitation. I run it three times a month in different, um, different times of the day to accommodate different time zones and working schedules. Um, it's good. It's good. It's just another forum where, people, where I can talk to people. 
Um, we have a wellness circle. We do a photography, like a photography group. Uh, we do. We launched Work Vivo recently, which is a a tool for um, I guess the more social interactions and and uh, culture amplification. Um, yeah, look, we do a lot of one-off stuff. You know, we do competitions. We had a drinks night recently. Uh, right now, we're doing a company workout. It's our first time doing it. Um, so this is my other, my other point, is that this will change over time. Uh, you know, you have to try new things. Sometimes things get stale. Um, yeah, and look, some of this is great if you have champions you can run with some of this stuff. It doesn't, doesn't all need to be top-down. In fact, it probably shouldn't all be top-down. Uh, Yeah, there may be some psychological issues how to address them. Uh, Josef is asking, yeah, well, look, there is. there is, And we, we do initiatives around wellness. Right now we're in the middle of a month long um, surviving April thing. We did, but we, we do kind of these wellness initiatives. We have people come in and give talks. We have put supports in place. I mentioned our wellness circle, but yeah, like it's a constant topic and it's something we, we try and do a bit around uh, wellness, mental health. Um, and loneliness, yeah. Um, okay, look, I'll, I'll just keep going for another bit because there's, there's a few questions. Um, so surveys and feedback. So this is really important. I think people would have, many managers will rely on feedback they get in person in the office and, and that's gone. So you need to be structured about gathering feedback from your staff. Um, and you know, think about this. This is what I, I'll talk a bit about what we do here. But you know, think about what might be missing. What you can maybe supplement what you're currently doing. Um, and likewise, obviously, if you have suggestions for me. Um, obviously, there's the normal employee surveys which we do. There are pulse surveys, so we take regular surveys and track changes over time, often asking a similar set of questions, so you can see if how you're trending. We can also break it down by department, so we can spot groups at risk or areas where we maybe need to do better. Um, and it's across a range of, a range of topics. Um, we gather anonymous feedback. And one great thing about this is we can have hold a conversation with somebody else anonymously so they can, well, so they can protect their anonymity. Um, so we get a lot of great feedback through that, especially when we introduce it first. People can be you know, often maybe a little intimidated saying something directly to a CEO, um, but they're happy to do it anonymously. But actually over time, I think people have realized that there's rarely any consequences to this stuff by always welcome feedback senior team too so they're now tend to do things far more openly um, but that's there for anybody who doesn't feel comfortable cross-departmental discussion groups uh, we you can tend to get a bit more siloed remotely you know especially if your structured communication are all through team meetings um, it can be a bit top-down so you know they're creating groups across creating teams that span departmental groups and companies is really useful um, and we create groups around particular items as well as, you know, groups that need to work together. Uh, regular structured one-on-ones, of course, team meetings, gather feedback everywhere. If you, if you, and if you're a manager of other managers, then I, I quite like holding skip level one-on-one -on -one meetings with their direct reports because that helps you get an unfiltered view of what's happening. It also builds relationships with other people in the organization um, and maybe sometimes you can help them out too and you can realize it's also done right, I think it's support for your own direct reports too. Um, so I, I do set these up on a regular meeting cadence. And of course, giving feedback needs to happen as well, but look, all, all the same good practice applies. Um, okay. How do we ensure, I'll just take one or two of these. Um, how do we ensure new hires are sufficiently onboarded where the traditional office environment facilities facilitates this more easily? That's a good question. Yeah, it's a tough one. And it's something as a remote company, we had to put quite a bit of work into. I think most people say our onboarding is very good, um, but it's, it's, a, it's, it's a lot of work. Um, you know, we do things, obviously look all the usual stuff, but we build training programs. We do, um, we assign mentors or buddies to people. It's often, the, the plan can depend on what department people are going into. Um, and like I said, you know, sales before, that was maybe one of the hardest ones that we kind of relied a bit more on doing something on person, writing long on calls and, and you know, be, being a bit more physically present. Most of the other ones, that, other roles have been okay, but it's been a good bit of work. And we had a, we have a good structured um, onboarding program. And I, I'd always meet the new hires as well. I think of tomorrow I'm meeting, you know, I do 
kind of meet groups of them as they come in. Um, COVID-19 makes many to move to work remotely, but who were working before COVID for SMEs companies remotely has lost their remote jobs. Um, I don't know, is that a question or a comment? But yeah, look, a lot, a lot of people have lost their jobs. Um, a lot of people I know, a lot of companies had to make cutbacks. It's awful. Um, I don't know many, I don't know an awful lot of remote companies that have to let people go, but I don't imagine it's usually different, right? Like if an industry is affected, it's affected. One good thing about remote companies is it's a little bit more resilient. You know, maybe not all our eggs are in one basket in terms of location, um, but also, you know, we can work during lockdown. Um, so that that's maybe helped us a little bit, but look, like, yeah, of course, um, people are using their jobs. Do I think senior management and remote companies are different? Uh, you come across as very approachable and humble even as a CEO. Have you seen traditional senior management change as they move into remote positions? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, and yeah, yeah, they, 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 they do. Um, I think for us, of course, we, we try to hire people that I think are, are good culture fit or at least a good fit for our values too. Um, but I would say you're right, like people do need to go on a bit of a cultural change. And I, I was talking a bit about maybe senior management often tend to be, um, maybe wouldn't have grown up, they, they would tend to be a little bit older sometimes, so they wouldn't have had, they're not digital natives in the way that a lot of younger people are. Um, so they wouldn't be as used to maybe social, social interactions without being physically present. Um, the other thing I'd say is that, yeah, you've got also got more of a history or more of a, of, of working in a given way, right? And if it's a really big change, that can be harder. That being said, of course, I think everybody that we've hired has gone on that journey. Um, and like I said in the early slide, you know, there's, okay, recreate what I'm doing in a remote environment and then gradually over time adapt to how it's done in a remote company or how it's done best practice. Um, but it's take, it's, it does take a while, it does take a while. Um, and I, I try, I'm gonna try and keep encouraging people and keep supporting people to, to make that transition. and do remote working in a way I think it's good. I think it does it well. Um, okay, let me just keep going. Um, that fits very much into the last slide I had here about culture. Um, is that most successful remote first companies create a high trust environment of value openness and transparency. Um, and I believe that type of culture is becoming an established good practice. And without it, it's difficult to work really well remotely. Um, and they're related, you know, transparency helps build trust and, it made, and trust makes it easier to be transparent. It, trust helps create a psychological safe space that allows people to be more open. And I get this feedback from our staff all the time. You know, we see it in our surveys, but like even this morning as I was preparing for the talk, I got somebody, somebody came in and talked to me over Slack, hey Shane, you know, I, like, I'm so motivated. Thank you for this feedback. You know, somebody submitted feedback to one of our feedback systems and I replied, because um, they had a genuine concern, like a really good concern. Um, and they just maybe didn't know what I know about some of the reasoning behind some decisions we make. Um, so they came and told me, oh, they didn't think this was a good idea, didn't understand why we did it. Um, and I explained it and, you know, it worked out really well. Like this is, I think this is how it's meant to work. Um, works well for us. And it was, you know, I, I, to prepare for this talk as well, I put a list of our top tips for working remotely um, and, I, and people could upvote them. Uh, and people pointed to culture as, as the most highly voted thing by our staff. Um, as to as what helps them be productive working remotely. And, and I think this is, this is kind of really key. So if you're gonna to get to the top of that mountain, I think ultimately you wanna be looking for creating a great remote working culture. Um, and that culture should usually value and include a, a high trust, it should be a high trust environment and be quite open. Um, and look, my final remarks, uh, assume positive intent. So there's a lot of research that shows lack of mutual knowledge among remote workers translates to a lower willingness to give coworkers the benefit of the doubt when things get difficult. Now, for example, you might be less likely to realize somebody's having a bad day than when you're in person. You can see them walking into an office, you can tell something's a bit wrong. Um, you will maybe interpret what they say a bit differently, but you don't know that reading an email. So it really helps if you assume positive intent. Obviously, you don't need to think everybody in your company's having a bad day. Um, but realize that most people have good intentions and at very minimum, always give them the benefit of the doubt. And show empathy, because it's particularly important right now. If you're worried about whether or not somebody's working, as a manager, just resist the urge to micromanage. Get on a call, see if they're doing okay. Get more context to understand what's really happening. 
your first step, step I think, is to show empathy. Um, and that's it. Thank you very much. Um, I put together a couple of resources here. If anybody wants them, I'll post them into the chat. And that's brilliant. Thank questions. you so much, Jane. Um, I know it's good a good value or a good thought to, to leave on. I know that's something we brought into Grow Remote, Assume Good Intent. Um, and it changes kind of how you approach things. It, it, it's really positive um, piece to do. So there's lots of questions for you. So, yeah. so we might, um, I know there was some up the top um, that, that we missed once that came in a bit yeah. earlier that might have been answered, but um, so what are your thoughts on uh, how homeworking coupled with bring your own device might have an impact on the business, capital investments in hardware and security threats, for example? Yeah, the, look, it's definitely people are needing to invest more in other hardware to enable remote working. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, that's part of the reason why remote working might stay around for a bit longer because you've already made this investment now and you can yeah. use it. Um, and yeah, of course, you might not need the same space to expand in an office too. So yeah, look, there's definitely an impact to, it, it comes with the cost, right? The hardware cost, but also training cost and, and um, to adapt to remote working. So yeah, look, definitely companies will be feeling this, um, yeah. but also hopefully it's something you can now use going forward. Yeah, I think the Gartner C, uh, um, study that you referenced with CFO said that we'll be a remote. I think that's probably because yeah. after seeing the numbers and they're like, <laughs> oh, we need to make this work, HR. Um, yeah, we already spent this. Yeah. How do you define a clear line between managers micromanaging remotely with calls, communication, or being too aloof and not engaging enough uh, with their team? Yeah, look, that's a that's a difficult one, right? There's a, yeah, I mean, I think most people will know, but at the same time, it's very hard for every role to lay down the rules about, okay, now that's okay, that's that's micromanagement. Um, I mean, obviously, a lot depends, I think, on where people are coming from. You know, if you're trying to trying to help them succeed, trying to, you know, provide the guard, the guidelines um, yeah. to make things work uh, rather than do their job for them or tell them exactly what to do. I'd say we were talking on culture before. I, I think scraping up is also very collaborative and I think that's very common. So it is about trying to work on a problem, solve the problem together. It's about trying to empower people and help them get what they need to get done um, rather than you know, straight, straight out telling people what to do and, and managing at a very fine, fine grain task level. Mm -hmm. you know, generally, I, I think we're, we try and, try and describe the outcome that you want. We give people enough freedom that the more, um, the more senior somebody is, like this comes with a bit management experience, right? But the more senior somebody is, the more they can, the more freedom they, they crave, the more they can um, work within that environment. You know, obviously, if somebody's new, if they're just just uh, starting out in, in work, they you can't give them a big broad task and give them tons of freedom. It just won't work. You have to size it. Um, mm. Yeah, people management. And um, the next question is around hybrid model. I find that very interesting because I think a lot mm. of companies are hybrid in Ireland in particular, and maybe that might yeah. be the model going forward. Maybe not. I'm not sure, Shane, if you've kind of had this, but how do managers place a fair model to assess in office in, in office employees who are seen all the time and others who are remote? Yeah, that's a good yeah. question. Yeah, it's really hard. Um, I'm not sure. I agree. That's very hard. Like, yeah, you should. You shouldn't be assessing people because they're seen in the office. Like that's not what it makes a good worker. Yeah. Um, you know, it's it's about output. It's about what they produce. It's, that should be clear. I don't think I can't think of a single job where you're going to assess them by the fact that they're in an office. Um, now, maybe if they're not putting in the work, if things aren't going well, that's another thing. But um, but certainly, yeah. I, like even if you, there's not a single role where you, you where you want to reward or evaluate them based on presenteeism. Um, and I'd say it actually can be quite negative. Like I certainly worked in places in the past where we were rewarded for working long hours, but people just hung around the office, dragged stuff out, worked late at night so the boss would see them. Um, I sat next I think, to somebody who learned Japanese for a couple of years and work, you know, but oh, yeah, there all the time. <laughs> um, I heard a story, I heard a line, and I was on Twitter, um, about how remote just accentuates any, any problems that you have. So if you are, you know, tracking people on how they come in, it's going to get worse uh, mm. when you go remote. Um, how much of a duty do you think the company has to its distributed workers um, to help them achieve a good setup at home? I, I think this is a concern of all companies at the moment. Um, mm. Yeah, and it's hard now to know exactly what you can do as well, right? Because, yeah. you know, shipping things and maybe yeah. um, 
you know, it's, it's, it's more awkward, right? There's longer waiting lists for equipment. And um, so I'm, I'm not really sure now, like, especially at this time, what's considered good practice. Yeah. Um, I mean, certainly, you know, there's, there's advocating good things, there's making available different resources. There's, you know, we run, I did a talk on ergonomics and, um, you know, like, Brilliant. yeah, they, they should put some work into it, but I don't know what, I, in terms of a duty, I, I'm not sure. Um, yes, and it's, it's an interesting question. Actually, we'll take that um, and I'll get a blog. I'll, I'll write that up, uh, that mm. answer. I know that we did work with Chambers Ireland and I, I think it's a blurry space. I'm not sure there is a black and white answer, so it's kind of up to the company. Um, yeah. But we'll get a, get a more definitive answer on yeah, that. The, yeah, and the, like, it'll vary by country as well. So. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, okay, I'm looking to move from an in-office job to a party remote two days a week. How do I navigate uh, the conversation? Um, any advice, Shane? I'm going to We're share all fully it remote, so I've never been there. Um, I've never had anybody that needs to go there in, in Scraping Hub. Yeah. Um, so I'm not really sure, but look, I'd imagine you're working remotely now. Are you not? And in which case, are you managing to do your job fine? Yeah. Um, can you, prove, can you prove it? Can you deliver when you're not in the office and build that trust with your with your manager to show that you get it just as much done? Um, I'm going to share a link to our Get Started Guide that includes a scripted guide by a remote company called Doist on a scripted like line by line, what they might say back to you, what you need to say back to that, etc. to speak to your manager. So that should be able um, to help you with that. Um, I, I, Doist put out a lot of good content as well around do, like the yeah. need for async communication. Obviously, it's their tools, but it's a case place that they're really very knowledgeable about. So it's probably a few good resources there. There are so many questions in here. I'm not quite sure we're going to hear everyone get out of here, Shane. Um, I think this is actually the most amount of questions we've had uh, so far. Um, okay, so you'll probably answer this in the course of your presentation. I, I'm not sure you did exactly. So I do believe that most people who are treated well in a remote company are more productive, enjoy their autonomy. But what do you do when it backfires when somebody does take advantage of the cult culture of trust? Um, it's something I'm trying to deal with at an, ex at an executive level right now, and I'm really struggling on how to bring in more accountability. That's obviously an important one because it's, it's, a, it's a risk, and that's what companies are, who are transitioning are interested in. They've heard yeah. all the hype, but they just want to know what can go wrong and how do we manage that. So any advice? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good one. Um, so how do you yeah how do you manage that um and how do you prevent people from let's say abusing some of the trust well i think one of the things that it comes back to for me and look i've seen it go wrong in scraping hub as well we haven't gotten it perfect over the last 10, almost 10 years um but most cases where there was a a problem it, it was it was also a mismanagement so where people so maybe there is somebody who actually really wasn't producing but the manager never called them on it. Um, you know, they never checked in. Hey, you were working great last month, but why are you not, you know, you seem to be struggling now. What's going on? And, you know, they, they let it slide. Um, I, I was saying about feedback to, to you know, give it quick and, and, and set expectations um, in, in the cases. And I can think of at least two examples where we didn't do that in Scraping Help where somebody did take advantage um, and it took a while to, to, to figure out. And, and in both cases, it was actually fairly obvious because they had, and for me, you know, a very, a pattern of, they were very capable, but they didn't seem to consistently produce. The comment just came in there in the chat to clarify the issues with the top tier manager. Um, I think there's probably some people issues that run across all companies, right? Uh, well, look, I mean, my company. biggest issues have been actually when, with some people who I've managed in person rather than remotely. Um, it opens you up to all kinds of other problems when you actually have physical people together um, as well. So like there's no silver bullet from a remote point of view there. I mean, the remote answer is, you know, to be on top of managing uh, what you're expecting of them and make sure you call them on it. Um, that's been it. And I haven't seen people really take too much advantage of that. From a, from a company point of view, obviously put like the right controls in place, but you just do all the stuff you'd normally do um, in an office as well. Like the, all, the same, all the same stuff applies. Yeah. Um, I don't think it gives you any any immunity to people maybe not performing just because you're clo you're physically closer to them. Yeah, and um, I do think that you answered this one, but I I'll ask again. Mm. Um, are you aware of any um, any way of tracking productivity other 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 than managers overseeing outputs? Certainly, my experience with my own team, productivity is the same or better. But in terms of presenting data on productivity, um, it would be great to get some tips 
on how to track this. And that's from Emma, who looks after public policy in Chambers, Ireland, and has been, just to put it in there, a fantastic support to Growing Rose. So uh, thank, thank you, Emma, and it's great to see you here. But uh, just on, on that question, Shane. Yeah, um, it can often be role specific, though. That's the problem. So somebody's talking about sales. I, I think, you know, it's very obvious. Every sales department has metrics. You can see exactly how everybody's performing. Um, other things, you know, if you have somebody who's writing for us, producing content for the blog, you know, they're producing the content calendar. Is it resonating with the audience? How is it doing? We measure it. Uh, software developers, you can see, you know, if it's uh, at, a slightly, at a slightly more structured way, you'd often measure things like uh, story points delivered or, you know, you can get quite uh, specific, but even not, even if you don't go crazy about measuring stuff, you still, your, your senior people will know. Um, they'll know if they're working alongside them. They'll know, okay, who's producing what. And you'll see it. Even if it's not data, you can still see it. Yeah. Um, so you'll still have an idea. Um, and usually, I think for almost every role, you'll know that. Um, or your management should. And if they can't describe that, if they, then, then I think, you know, it's a bit of a problem. Um, yeah, I think we're all kind of looking for the silver bullet or the magic bullet uh, for, for all the problems, <laughs> if, if that's okay. Um, we're, we're coming up close to time now. Um, there's another question, if there's time, do you have new hires set up in their home office? I think you did answer that already in terms of the monitor, peripherals, et, et cetera. That's a question that comes in a lot for every remote company, Shane. Is the equipment center or do you have yeah. to rely on your own? Yeah, um, I, I think Tracy would be good if we could put something together on that because I'm not sure what people should do and I'm also yeah. just not sure what's possible now. I think yeah. at the very minimum, like it's very easy to buy some stuff to make it more ergonomic. Obviously, we send laptops to employees, mm -hmm. but uh, we, you know, yeah, it's easy to add a few bits and pieces to make it more ergonomic yeah. and just raise it. Um, and then you can go up. Like the thing, what tends to happen with people who work remote full time, like myself, I'll go way above what the what any company would send me, right? Like I'll... I bought my stand, my variable height desk before anybody had variable height desks yeah. and I customize everything because, you know, I spend more time in this little room than mm -hmm. I do in almost anywhere else, right? So it's more important to me to spend money on a nice monitor than it is in a car. Yeah. Um, so and I think that, John Burden, who's direct support for Shopify, shared a video of his office, home office, um, and he, again, went above and beyond because these things are just personal to you. Like he has a weird mat that moves your feet around or something. I don't know. I saw his mat actually. Yeah. I'm a bit curious so, about it. <laughs> and, and the slippers that go with it. So I don't know. So there are lots of things that are just unique to people. Um, and it, it's great actually down to people who are sharing uh, their office and there's a thread in our Slack about that as well. Yeah. I, the, um, the other thing about working from home in your home office as well, it's like, I, like a lot of people will put a bit of fitness equipment in their office or, yeah. you know, so they can get up and do something. You don't need, this is what I'm saying about getting to like embracing the nature of remote work. You don't yeah. need to stick to recreate exactly what you had. In a, in a physical office you know a lot of people can take a break do some squats or a bit of yoga or, you know you'd look you'd feel super self-conscious doing that in, in, an, in, a, in an office in front of your colleagues but yeah. um, there's nothing stopping you doing it at home i saw there was a tweet from conor murphy uh whose text i tweeted out that some one of his guys said we did 7.6 miles worth of meeting today because he had a treadmill under his desk <laughs> and that's what he was doing so i thought that was that was an interesting one i'm jealous um, I, I, yeah that's yeah. the next purchase yeah, yeah ne next level and um, okay last one i think and um, which is it's very interesting in terms of there are 300 co-working spaces across ireland chain i'm not sure if you're aware but they are and i know you do a little bit of work in, in republic of work but they're very important to communities they're usually led by maybe not for profits and community coming together trying to rejuvenate the area um, is there anything that co-working spaces can do to, to support remote workers because i know most space managers are more than willing they're, they're so willing to do um, whatever is needed but it just doesn't always fit the other side yeah so. yeah well look i i think yeah you're right tracy like we work out of the we work here in cork or yeah. we, 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 we work in dublin and the republic of work in cork um, and they're both great you know it's it's yeah, like they do a lot of social events. You get a lot of the social interaction. I know a lot of the other members, especially in the Republic of Work where I'm pretty often. Um, it's really great, like it, it helps an awful lot. And my favorite way to work is to do a day a week, um, yeah. one or two days a week outside of my home office at least. Um, so I love the hybrid way of working, but many other people in Scraping Up prefer going to the co-working space all the time. I'm lucky now that I've built a nice uh, home office, but I didn't always have it mm. um, and you know, quite a lot. Uh, from my career, I, I while working remotely, it's very convenient to go to 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 a co-working space. Um, so no, they they perform I, I think a, a great function and an essential function. Yeah. Um, so, I, but I'm not sure. Like, I wouldn't have great tips for them. I think for the most part, what they provide right now is pretty good. Yes. Um, 
Yeah, I'd agree uh, across the board, uh, probably just about making yourself uh, known to, to people in the surrounding areas and they know they can hop in. Yeah, I think a lot of people would be surprised that there's 300 um, spaces yeah. like that all, all across Ireland and that, yeah. you know, and it's, it's even more of an option now for them to relocate. Absolutely. So, and I'll send out a link, but techireland.org forward slash hubs is where you see a list of all the hubs. Um, Shane, safe to say, just there's a huge hunger for the knowledge that you have. Uh, so thank you for fielding all of those questions. And um, thank you for the thank yous that are coming in the chat. We'll record this and I'll send out a following, uh, an email to follow up and I'll link to some of the blogs that Scraping Hub have. And even Ian Duffy, who was on the call earlier on, has documented his old office and, and how he works and, and those pieces. And it's really, really useful. Um, Shane, thank you, thank you, thank you. Said it at the start, I'll say it at the end. Thanks a million for all you give uh, to, to, the, to the wider community. Uh, it's massively appreciative. Uh, sorry, we're massive. That's a pleasure, Tracy. Uh, thanks for having me on. And I'm happy to support, uh, support you guys anytime. Brilliant. Okay, with that, thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. Bye.